Standard Time perspective. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, my name is Chaim Angel. I'm the National Scholar of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, and this is part two of a three-part series on the land of Israel, specifically from a biblical perspective, as opposed to a contemporary current events type of thing, although obviously there is a connection between uh, then and now, as far as we are concerned, but it, it's it's not a, it's really not about contemporary political situation or even the modern state of Israel, except for brief references to it as it fits into the biblical scheme. Uh, given that this is part two, that means that we already had last week part one. Uh, for those of you who were there, so you already know, if you were not able to be there, here is a link to uh, the YouTube video. So you may watch that at any time at your convenience. If you're going to watch it now, just keep it on mute, but you can watch it any other time and get filled in with the Torah side of the equation. That's what we did last time. And now we're up to the prophetic side of the equation where we already dealt with the Torah roots of everything. And now it's time to look ahead to the prophetic canon. There's endless text that I could choose for this one, even more than in the Torah, I suppose. So I tried to pick a representative sampling of prophetic texts that shed light on different points along the way. One of them, is something that we mentioned at the very end of last week, so it's a good way to segue into this week, and that is uh, there are no holidays on the Jewish calendar in any way reliving or commemorating the entry into the land of Israel, which is remarkable when you think about it. You talk about this end of the 40-year journey through the desert. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, finally gets them to the doorstep of the promised land. His disciple Joshua takes them across the border. They conquer the land. They distribute it. Now, finally, happily ever after, everything is settled. It's exactly what God had promised the patriarchs and matriarchs. How awesome is that? Answer, very awesome. However, there's still no holiday. It's even more remarkable when you look at the book of Joshua. There are several texts when they cross the Jordan River. So it's a very similar scene to the splitting of the Red Sea 40 years earlier. Here, it's because it's a river and not a sea. So the river, because it flows downstream, so it forms a pile where God basically stops up the river and it goes higher and higher and higher. And then the rest of the river just flows downstream. And suddenly you have dry land through which the people of Israel can cross. So while that's going on, we have source number one over here. These are the sources that we sent out to you. I will share my screen anyway. Oh, that's chat. So let's try to hit share screen and there you go. Uh, for those who don't have for any reason the source sheets, I can, I can work that out for you. Give me a moment now. Okay, we're doing better. And then I just want to go chat in front of me. Okay, now we're good. Okay, source number one. So I will read the English over here, but you have the Hebrew as well. Joshua said to them, this is as they are crossing, walk up to the ark of the Lord your God. In the middle of the Jordan, each of you shall lift a stone onto his shoulder, corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. This shall serve as a symbol among you. In time to come, when your children ask, what is the meaning of these stones for you? You shall tell them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off because of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. When it passed through the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And so these stones shall serve the people of Israel as a memorial for all time. So it's not just, oh my goodness, I find this in the 28th first century remarkable that, that we don't have any holidays to commemorate any point of entry to the land, but it's even more remarkable when you listen to Joshua's words. He sounds just like the Haggadah of Pesach, which is just quoting excerpts from the Torah. We want our children to know the message. Why do we do this for? Why do we have Matzah? Why do we have Maror? Why are we telling the Seder? Why are we doing all these things? The answer is we should tell them. God redeemed our people from the land of Egypt. Okay, great. So Joshua is doing the same thing using the exact same terminology, saying, okay, here we have a commemorative monument set up so that our children will ask, and then they'll do. It sounds great, but there's no holiday that forces us to recount this. And Joshua, several occasions, uses similar language. So that's just point number one. Point number one is that even though Joshua clearly is trying to enshrine the entry to the land of Israel as a permanent memorial for the people, that's great, but no holiday emerges from this, just monuments. Okay, so that's point number one. Point number two is after a couple of battles against Jericho and then the Ai, Joshua leads the nation to Shechem, 
where they build an altar. This was all commanded in the Torah. God commanded Moses to do this. And now Joshua is doing that. What's interesting is the vision of it. Uh, source number two, Joshua chapter eight. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Eval, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. And indeed, it's in the Torah. There's a commandment for this. As is written in the book of the teaching of Moses, an altar of unhewn stone upon which no iron had been wielded. They offered it on burnt offerings to the Lord and brought sacrifices of well-being. Okay, so far so good. And there on the stones, he inscribed a copy of the teaching that Moses had written for the Israelites. There's some debate over exactly what was written on these stones. I mean, it's hard to believe that the entire five books of Moses, what we call the Torah, was written then. But that's okay. There's a wide range of opinion, anywhere from the Ten Commandments to the essence of certain commandments to just various passages of the Torah. It's all cool with me. The idea is that the Torah's vision is kind of when you're entering the land, you're setting up this covenant to say, this is our constitution. We want to remain in the land. We're going to observe and be faithful to the Torah. Now, in the pshat, in the plain sense of the text, it's very plain that the object of this is to teach the people of Israel. This is, this is how we're going to remain in the land, which is what the whole Torah keeps on stressing, as we discussed last week. That's fine. The Talmud, in one place, it's in Masachet Sotah, I'll just write down the source for you. We don't have it in the source sheets, but I'll tell you where it is. Page 35b. In Tractate Sotah, the Talmud says that Joshua actually had to write a translation of this Torah passage, whatever was written, into 70 languages, seven zero, which is the traditional number of nations in the world based on the Torah in Genesis chapter 10. Now there's nothing in the Torah or here that suggests that he wrote 70 copies of this in all these different languages. It sounds like the purpose of it is to teach the people of Israel to be faithful. All the same, the Talmud wants to look outward and say, yes, Purpose A of the Israelites keeping the Torah is to be faithful to God and the covenant. But purpose B, which the Talmud is emphasizing here, is that we have a message for humanity. And that, hu that human message is that everybody should be able to access the Torah in any language that they speak. And that's what Joshua needed to do. And you might say, good, it's an excellent message. It's just not the message of this passage. But wait, uh, if you read on in verse 33, all Israel... Stranger and citizen alike, with their elders, officials, and magistrates, stood on either side of the ark, facing the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the Lord's covenant. Half of them faced Mount Gerizim, and half of them faced Mount Eval, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded them of old in order to bless the people of Israel. Uh, the cool part here, for our purposes, is who exactly is this stranger? Who are, who are these people? Where do these strangers come from? It sounds like there are non-Israelites, people who are not part of our nation, who are included in the ceremony, who are there, who are welcome, and who are already being brought into this covenant, not as Israelites. They don't seem to be part of us. These are what we would call the ger toshav, the resident alien. But it sounds like we already had them now, right as we entered the land of Israel. And then if you jump down to verse 30, well, we're up to 34, so let's just read it. After that, he read all the words of the teaching, the blessing and the curse, just as is written in the book of the teaching. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua failed to read in the presence of the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children and strangers who accompanied them. Wow, twice in three verses, we hear about these strangers. Okay, I don't think that's an accident. I think it's very important that the Torah is emphasizing the strangers are already there. So going back to that Talmudic passage that I mentioned, that the Torah needed to be translated into 70 languages. So you see, there's nothing here about that. But you also see that the roots of the Talmudic opinion are found in the passage itself, that already it's Israel and some other people receiving the Torah and, and being expected to be faithful to it in one form or another. Okay, so that's what we have from the book of Joshua. We have that Joshua wants to memorialize the crossing of the Jordan and all these other events, but we still have no holiday for it. We also see that the people of Israel, not only are they expected to keep the Torah in order to remain in Israel, that's the basic point of the ceremony that we just read, but that there is a vision to all nations of the world that's twice emphasized in this passage from the get-go, that we expect that everybody should be influenced by the people of Israel. Uh, 
we never know why God chose this particular land to be the land for the chosen people. It's not clear, but I'll just draw out here that one point seems to be that we are at the crossroads of all of human civilization of that time. We have Egypt on one side and Mesopotamia on the other side and constant interchange of ideas, caravans, business, all of that. Israel being smack dab in the middle of that is a means of we have an opportunity to influence everybody without having to go on a missionary journey. We can just stay there, build an ideal society, and people as they pass through will say, wow, here's a different culture from everything that we see everywhere. This is impressive. We want to be like that. And that seems to be part of what God is trying to set up in an ideal world. Alas, not all of this ideal world happened, but this is, seems to be at least part of what's going on over there. Okay, now, traffic time. I've read that in Israel, there's a set day for commemorating Joshua and co-entering the land. The problem is that it occurs in the summer. Can't be any programming for schools, bummer. Uh, that's fine. In modern Israel, you can do whatever you want. All I can tell you is that there's no biblical holiday. I'm aware, I'm aware that there's a modern effort at I'm memorializing the entry to the land of Israel, but it's telling that it took until the founding of the modern state of Israel for us to have such a holiday, right? There never was a holiday. The Torah didn't enshrine any of that. The book of Joshua didn't. Nobody did. There was no holiday for entering into the land. The holidays that we observe uh, are for the things that took place pre-entry to the land. They're, they go back to the Torah itself. Okay. So that's, that's it for the book of Joshua. Jumping ahead to the saga of King David and Solomon. So now we've jumped ahead a couple hundred years. So King David and King Solomon do a lot of things, but the ones that we need to emphasize for now is that David, besides being the founder of the Davidic dynasty, he moved the capital of Israel from Hebron, which had been easily the most important city in Israel to that moment, to Jerusalem which is amazing because Jerusalem has no historical significance by name prior to King David in the, in, the, in the Bible. There are a couple of stories in Genesis that seem to revolve around Jerusalem. I'm aware of that. But the word Jerusalem appears a total of zero times in the entire five books of Moses, in the entire Torah. It never shows up by name. And David was did something very important by moving the capital from Hebron, which was the first plot of land that our family owned, as we discussed last week, with Abraham purchasing land in Hebron to bury Sarah and ultimately himself, and then the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried there. This was our first land holding in Israel. David rightly assumed the throne there by God's own command. And suddenly, David on his own moves to Jerusalem. That was quite an initiative. He then also comes up with the idea of building a temple, a permanent shrine for the ark. Nobody had thought of that before. Up until now, the ark was in the tabernacle, and it's been there for hundreds of years, so it's semi-permanent, but God just had this mobile shrine, and there was no sense that once you come to the land of Israel, then you will get a permanent place. No, there's no sense whatsoever that there has to be one spot but David decides there should be, and Solomon is the one who enacts that. God tells David no, for whatever reasons. And then Solomon is the one who builds the temple. Now, the temple, you got to understand, let's, let's play this up a little bit, is not just a building. It's not even just a place which became the religious center for Israel. Uh, basically, what the Garden of Eden is supposed to be in the Bible is, uh, what, what the temple is supposed to be is the Garden of Eden. And conceptually, that really is what it is. The idea is that all humanity was supposed to serve God in the Garden of Eden, but instead Adam and Eve sinned. They ate from the tree of knowledge. We know the story well. They were banished from the Garden of Eden, and God guarded the Garden of Eden with Keruvim, some class of angel, bearing fiery swords. So forget it. You're not going back in there. Uh, the only other place in the whole Torah where you have these Keruvim is when they build the tabernacle. There are Keruvim on top of the Ark, the golden Keruvim, the cherubs in English, very helpful translation, the Keruvim, which bear the God's presence. And then you also have Keruvim embroidered into the curtain that separated the sections of the tabernacle. It seems very plain that these Keruvim are meant to mimic the Garden of Eden. And further, here's a nice bonus, all the way in the book of Proverbs, uh, you have a proverb here in source three, it's a fairly familiar verse. For those just it's regularly in the liturgy and in, in, in the prayer book. She is a tree of life to those who grasp her. 
and whoever holds onto her is happy. The Tanakh, the Bible has transformed a tree of life from being some magical fruit tree in the Garden of Eden, that if you munch on it, you gain physical immortality. That's what the tree seems to be over there. And all of a sudden it becomes this conceptual idea. If you cling to Torah wisdom, then you have your eternality. It's not a tree of life that grants physical immortality. It's one that connects us to eternity. It's no accident that the Torah and the Ark suddenly become the tree of life. And so you have these Kruvim guarding our tree of life, and that's really what the temple, and before that the tabernacle, that's what they were intended to be. And King Solomon himself, you know, it's very nice to think about, we wait for the messianic era. The truth of the matter is, when you read the book of Kings, you know that King Solomon basically was the prototypical messianic king. He wasn't just a very wise and excellent king. He was, he's what the messianic king should be. He was a righteous king. He was a prophet. All the nation of Israel was, so far as we can tell, righteous and united. There was peace in the surrounding area. There was a temple. God's presence occupied that temple. Everything is there. And then to top it all off, all the nations of the world come flooding to Jerusalem to see the temple and to meet King Solomon. When you read the biblical account in Kings, the book of Kings, about King Solomon, you realize you're not just reading about a fabulous king. You're reading about what the messianic king and era are supposed to look like. Alas, King Solomon himself, I hate to say this, completely ruined everything by allowing idolatry back into the kingdom. And that's what chapter 11 of the book of Kings is all about. But until that moment, we basically had a taste of what the messianic era should be. The only difference, by the way, of later prophetic visions of the messianic era versus what you get in the book of Kings is what we call the ingathering of the exiles. You don't have kibbutz galiot in King Solomon's time. You don't have the ingathering of the exiles because there were no exiles yet. Okay, so you didn't need that piece. So, but everything else is the same. When you talk to the prophets about what the ideal era should be, all they're doing is describing King Solomon's reign, plus those Israelites who have been exiled will return. That's it. That's the only notable difference between their visions and what you get about King Solomon. So this is it. King Solomon is this messianic king. We have the Garden of Eden. Everything is looking fantastic. And then, oh, I love this piece. Solomon at the temple dedication, where he talks about how the people of Israel will be able to pray either in it, or if they're not physically in Jerusalem, they could always pray facing it. What he doesn't even anticipate, what you and I know only too well is, even if there's no temple there, we still face it, right? Solomon didn't anticipate that possibility. He imagined that Israelites, wherever they go, can always face Temple Mount because the temple is going to be there. And we had to learn the hard way that we're going to do that even in the absence of a temple altogether. And we continue to do that to this very day. But one of the key points of Solomon's dedication prayer in source number four over here, he knew full well that this temple is not just for what you and I call the Jewish people. It's not just for the people of Israel. He says, or if a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land for the sake of your name, for they shall hear about your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes to pray toward this house, oh, here in your heavenly abode, grant all that the foreigner asks you for. Thus, all the peoples of the earth will know your name and revere you, as does your people Israel. And they will recognize that your name is attached to this house that I have built. Solomon says at the temple's inception that it's meant for all God-fearing people. It never was intended just for the people of Israel to serve God. It was always intended for all God-fearing people. And then he goes on later. That's why there's a dot, dot, dot there. And may these words of mine, which I have offered in supplication before the Lord, be close to the Lord our God day and night, that he may provide for his servant and for his people Israel, according to each day's needs, to the end that all the peoples of the earth may know the Lord alone is God. There is no other. He expects that all people of the world ultimately will serve God. And that's the prayer that King Solomon makes at the temple dedication. It's really amazing. So from the get-go, the land of Israel is at the cro cultural crossroads of the, of the world at that time. There's an expectation in the Torah that the people of Israel will build their ideal society, built around the, the model of the Torah, and that nations of the world will be inspired by that and ultimately even serve God in the temple, which is basically a garden of Eden. So all humanity will be served like they were at the very beginning of creation. This moment, we turn back to the traffic. <laughs>
Let me say crossroads. To this day, I think Israel is the center of one of the world's key flight paths for migrating birds. It's geographically central. See if we can only influence them too. That would be awesome. But but excellent. Yeah, yeah. We're we're the land of Israel really is in the middle of a lot of stuff. It's incredible. Doesn't Malachi speak and hear from Kruvim? Uh, maybe you mean Ezekiel. I thought it was Kruvim in uh, in uh, he, 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 that the Kruv appears to him, Malachi. I that think, we I learned think, together. I, I think you're referring to Yechezkel or Ezekiel. Oh, it is Yechezkel. There's all, there's all kinds of of Kruvim action over there. There's, so far as I know, no Kruvim action in Malachi, but 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 we learned both of them together, Len. So you're in a good place, and I'm glad that you're bringing it all yeah, together. Yeah, I know, I know. If it all, so the book of Ezekiel has all kinds together. of Kruvim. But for the record, he doesn't speak to or hear from the Kruvim. He speaks to and hears from God, who is riding upon the Kruvim in the book of Ezekiel. God is the speaker there, not the Kruvim. But the Kruvim are very present in that book. Okay. All right, so I think we're good. All right. So very good. So right now we're in this pre, you, it's really, this is the model of what the land of Israel is supposed to be. King Solomon's reign with the temple and all of that. Uh, the ominous part comes right after King Solomon finishes this glorious praise and prayer. Hold on one second. I'll be coming and then we will pick it up. They never make these things big enough, but in the meantime, it's, it's, it's all good. Okay. God responds to King Solomon very favorably. Don't be misled by the tiny excerpt that I've given you here. You got to read the whole thing. It's a very favorable response that God gives, explaining that he's accepted Israel's prayer and Solomon's prayer, and he occupies the temple. It's all good stuff. Uh, but in the context of that, God also throws a serious threat into the dedication ceremony. It's very ominous, where he says in source five, but if you and your descendants turn away from me and do not keep the commandments and the laws which I've set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will sweep Israel off the land which I gave them. I will reject the house which I've consecrated to my name and Israel shall become a proverb and byword among all the peoples. Okay, so at the temple dedication ceremony where God accepts the temple, occupies it, everything is wonderful. God also threatens destruction. He says, as long as you are faithful to the vision that I have set out for you in the Torah, great. That's exactly what I want. I'll be here forever, and you'll be here forever, and the temple will be here forever. But if you violate my covenant, well, then that's it. All bets are off. You go into exile, and the temple will be destroyed. So this ominous note that God lays out there, and again, the speech that God gives to Solomon, I don't want to call it a speech, whatever, God's, God's retort to Solomon's prayer of dedication uh, is generally very favorable and loving, but he also reminds Solomon and the people of Israel that there is a responsibility having a temple. It's not just a wonderful thing to have. Unfortunately, as we know the rest of history, Solomon began undermining the temple himself with his idolatry, and that simply carried through the period of the Book of Kings until finally, finally, God decreed destruction against Jerusalem and Israel. And sure enough, there was a, there was a destruction. It's not enough to say that this was a punishment for unfaithfulness, although it was, that's certainly part of the story. The prophets understand that what happened here is all of God's intent from the time of creation have been undermined. The prophet Jeremiah, who lived in the sixth century BCE and witnessed the Babylonian destruction of the temple, says it best in source six, I look at the earth and it is, it is unformed and void. The Hebrew is tohu vavohu. This is the only place in all Tanakh where you have exactly this expression outside of the second verse of the entire Torah. Before God created anything, everything was tohu vavohu. And then the whole point is God then separated first light and dark, and then he moved on with the rest of creation. And it's all predicated on good behavior of humanity. Well, Jeremiah living at the time where everything is falling apart says, we've restored tohu vavohu. All of God's projects are null and vo void, and we're simply back to this chaotic state pre-creation. The book of Kings, which is traditionally authored by Jeremiah, and certainly written from that time period also, follows the same suit by noting that when the Israelites are exiled from their land, they go to two places. One is Babylonia, and the other one is Egypt. Babylonia is the area from which Abraham came originally. 
So suddenly the whole Abraham project is null and void. God told Abraham, leave your land, the Mesopotamian region, and come over to what became the land of Israel. Well, that's done. Now, the, now his descendants are returning to that homeland. And Egypt, I don't need to tell you, that's where we began as a nation. And suddenly the whole Moshe project, the whole Moses project, with the people of Israel leaving Egypt and going to Israel, that also is undone. And so what Jeremiah is describing in terms of uh, res restoration of tohu vavohu, this unformed and void world, is quite accurate to what he is witnessing. It's much bigger than just a terrible catastrophic moment in Israel's history, that everything is null and void. The Abraham project is done. The Moses project is done. They've lost their land. It really seems like everything is over. Uh, the Book of Kings, it's not in our source sheets, but I'll tell you where it is. So you can look it up on your own. I'm still very old fashioned. I use the Roman numerals for the books of kings and stuff like that. But you can use the number two, the Arabic numeral, if that makes you happier. Uh, one time it actually cost somebody. I remember somebody gave a, a talk and quoted from Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, which is an ancient Mishnah teaching some of the most basic Jewish religious ethics and teachings anywhere outside of the Bible itself. And alas, the speaker had read from something that used a Roman numeral two. But the speaker didn't know that it was a Roman numeral. So this person quoted from chapter 11 of, of, of the Ethics of the Fathers. If you know the Ethics of the Fathers, there are six chapters. So I was trying to figure out why the speaker would say chapter 11. I'm like, oh, this person read from the Roman numerals. And there you go. So I, I don't want to mislead anybody. This is the second book of Kings, not the 11th. And maybe I should just start using the Arabic too and avoid that kind of confusion in the meantime. That verse is what says that the temple and the king's palace were destroyed by the Babylonians. One verse knocks out the whole thing. That Jerusalem, which has become the capital of God's kingdom and also the capital of the political state of Israel, they've all been undermined on one day when the Babylonians destroy everything in the sixth century. It's 586 BCE. That's what's happening over here. Now you gotta understand this catastrophe was so big that the people of Israel really thought that this was the end. It's not like, oh no, dark day, let's repent and restore God's favor. People were not thinking like that at all. People were thinking, okay, time to become Babylonians. The God Israel project is done. The Torah is null and void. And we should just become like everybody else. Everybody else assimilated into Babylonian culture. So in source seven, you really hear the bleakness in the book of Lamentations. These are the last four verses of the book of Lamentations written from the time of the destruction. But you are, O oh Lord, are enthroned forever. Your throne endures through the ages. Why have you forgotten us utterly, forsaken us for all time? Take us back, O Lord, to yourself. Let us come back. Renew our days of old. For truly you have rejected us, bitterly raged against us. So it doesn't end on this happy, positive, optimistic anything. It ends on this terribly bleak note where the people of Israel genuinely feel this is the end. You understand that Jewish tradition, if you're a synagogue goer on, on the ninth day of Av, Tisha B'Av, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to read a biblical book to its end and end on a, a sorrowful note like this one, where we talk about God being permanently rejecting us. So tradition requires that we recite verse 21 a second time after that, so that we end up on a more favorable note. But the book doesn't end on that favorable note. Our tradition makes us because our tradition is very hopeful based on the messianic prophecies of the prophets. But the book of Lamentation ends in this complete state of darkness. And it's important to hear its voice so that you understand what we're talking about here. The entire people of Israel felt that God had rejected them permanently. All right, so here we go back to the traffic on that very dark note, I'm sorry. The only place in the world where alphabetic script developed thus facilitating communication and spread of religion, good. If the temple is also the conduit for God to connect with the non-Israelite peoples, why are they punished by the destruction of the temple, which was caused by Israelite misdeeds? Uh, you're right, everybody suffers that consequence. It's an excellent observation. I, I don't know how to answer it better than, you know, like let's say a man commits murder and now he's executed in court. It also inflicts terrible hardship onto the man's family. What do they do wrong? <laughs> They're innocent people. They may not even know that the father committed murder. Right. And you're right. There's a catastrophe and painful consequences, in this case, really dreadful uh, with the execution of or even the imprisonment of the father. And yet that's the way that it goes here too. the people of Israel are entrusted with the temple. And if they violate it, they cannot have it, even though that means God's vision for the world is stalled. 
I think that that is a consequence of all of this. So I think that your question is the answer. I think that it's a, it, it creates a problem for all humanity, not just the people of Israel. And that's why the prophets had to come around and correct a fundamental error that pretty much everybody besides the prophets seem to have felt. To use modern terminology, which is also the ancient prophetic terminology, it's not me just being 21st century needing a proper image for this. When you talk about uh, the God-Israel relationship at the time of the destruction, which everybody was talking about after the destruction, uh, if you picture the God-Israel relationship as a marriage, so the people of Israel genuinely believe that God had divorced them, that there was a permanent severance of this relationship. And it took the prophets to come along and say, no, it's not a divorce, it's a separation. God wants to rehabilitate the relationship. God can't be with you right now because you've been very unfaithful, but God wants you to come back. So a very poignant expression of that is here in source number eight in the book of Isaiah chapter 50. Thus said the Lord, where is the bill of divorce of your mother whom I dismissed? There's no divorce. It's a separation, people. God waits with open arms for the people of Israel to repent, to become faithful in the marriage again, and to return. And which of my creditors was it to whom I sold you off? You were only sold off for your sins and your mother dismissed for your crimes. It was a blip, the destruction. It wasn't a permanent severing of the relationship. This is not a divorce. Well, statements like this, thankfully, protected hope in at least enough of the Jews at that time, which is why you and I are here to talk about it. Without these hopeful messages, and there are a bunch of similar prophecies, without those, I think we would have despaired, become Babylonians, and that would have been the end of the Jewish people as we know it. Instead, all these prophetic stresses on this is a separation, not a divorce, gave the people of Israel a lot of hope. And we start seeing passages such as the chapter in Isaiah, listen to me, you will pursue justice. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock you were hewn from to the quarry you were dug from. Look back to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who brought you forth. For he was only one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. Truly the Lord has comforted Zion, comforted all her ruins. He has made her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Gladness and joy shall abide there, thanksgiving and the sound of music. That's great stuff. I mean, it's amazing to invoke the patriarchal covenant, and it's nice that he mentions Sarah too. Sarah is very infrequently mentioned after she dies throughout the entire rest of the Bible. But all the same, the invoking of Abraham and Sarah is a way of saying, hey, people, this covenant is forever. It goes back to last week's talk where we spoke about the term achuzat olam, eternal holding for the nation, which God promised Abraham already. Here, God is just stressing, that's what it is. The land of Israel belongs to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whether or not these descendants live in the land. So the fact that they happen to be in exile right now in Babylonia is a painful blow to the people, but it's not a permanent blow to the people. And that's what God is saying time and again throughout the prophecies of redemption from the time of the destruction. Jeremiah took a much more practical approach as well in source 10. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to the whole community which I exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, Give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, and seek the welfare of the city to which I have exiled you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its prosperity you shall prosper. In other words, when you're in exile, build a Jewish community. Build roots. Set up institutions. Don't assimilate. Build a community there. But thus says the Lord, when Babylon 70 years are over, I will take note of you and I will fulfill you to my promise of favor to bring you back to this place. Okay, so this is incredible that God is commanding the people through Jeremiah to build community in the exile. In other words, it's not over. The project is not over. And in a couple of generations, you will return and then you can rebuild the land. Prophets constantly prophesy the rebuilding of the temple, the purification of the land. And then of course, one of the all time classics, we'll skip 11 for now, we'll go down to 12. This is the classic vision of Ezekiel, also from the time of the destruction. This is the, the vision of the dry bones coming to life, one of the most celebrated of all the prophecies of consolation. He said to me, O oh mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So what happened was Ezekiel envisioned a valley strewn with bones. God said, I can bring these back to life. And sure enough, he did. 
And then he says that that whole vision is a metaphor for the people of Israel. So let's just start that passage over again. He said to me, oh, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We are doomed. Prophesy, therefore, and say to them, thus said the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and lift you out of the graves, O my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. It doesn't mean that they are literally going to be resurrected. It means that the nation as a nation, you feel like you are dead, but you're not dead. You're going to come back to life. You're going to come back to the land of Israel. Uh, one thing that gets lost in the English, so here we go to the Hebrew. When, when Ezekiel quotes the people here, I, I blocked it here in verse 11, when it says that our, our hope is gone, the Hebrew is tikvatenu, that we've lost hope, which is exactly how the people feel at this moment. So you understand that the writers of the Hatikva took the, those words from here. And we say, Od lo avda tikvatenu, we have not lost our hope. This is a reference to these verses in Ezekiel. And it's a way of saying we were not dead for these last 2,000 years. We always held on. We always held on to, to our hope. And that's what gave us the ability 2,000 years later to rebuild our land. So that emerges from this classic and celebrated prophecy. And prophecies like these were vital for keeping the Jewish people together at a time when they really seemed, they really felt that everything was lost. Okay, so so far we've discussed how there are no holidays to commemorate the entry of the land of, to the land of Israel or anything else, but from Joshua's time onward, Joshua is the leader who took them in, uh, there was a visible sense that the Torah is meant to be the code by which Israel stays in its land, but also it was already given as a universal message that all nations of the world should be influenced by the favorable and good society that the people of Israel should build while they are there. King Solomon understood that very well when he built the temple, which mimicked the Garden of Eden. Unfortunately, idolatry brought that whole situation back to uh, Tohu Vavohu, an unformed and void world that we talked about. The prophets had to remind the people of Israel that this is a separation, not a divorce, and that the people of Israel always will return to their land which is simply bequeathed to them through Abraham and Sarah all the way back. Okay, so that's that piece of the puzzle. Moving on to a different theme entirely. We have this land of milk and honey thing. That's not a trivial point. It's not just, oh, what a pleasant, wonderful land and fertile land that, that the land of Israel is. The first time that we hear that expression is when Moses is getting his very first prophecy at the burning bush. And God tells him, I am, he said, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord continued, I have marked well the plight of my people in, his, in Egypt, and have heeded their outcry because of their taskmasters. Yes, I am mindful of their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the region of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, so on and so forth. The agricultural fertility of Israel is something which is vital to understanding its religious dimension. And in fact, messianic prophecies never tire of talking about how the fertility of Israel belongs to the people of Israel, and that you know that redemption is on the way when the land can bloom again. The prophet Amos, for example, in source 14, in his messianic prophecy, the only messianic prophecy that he has, he lived in the 8th century BCE, here's source number 14, the very last verses in the book of Amos. A time is coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall meet the reaper and the treader of grapes him who holds the bag of seed, when the mountains shall drip wine and all the hills shall wave with grain. I will restore my people Israel. They shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall till gardens and eat their fruits, and I will plant them upon their soil, never more to be uprooted from the soil I have given them, said the Lord your God. So the idea of agricultural prosperity in Israel, that's something which is built into the theology of the land. It's not just a nice benefit of living there. It's that it will belong to the people of Israel. So you have one dramatic statement in the Talmud, in source 15 here, in Masachet Sanhedrin, in Tractate Sanhedrin, 98a. Rabbi Abba also said, there can be no more manifest sign of redemption than this. What is said, but ye, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. So Rabbi Abba said the clearest sign that Messiah is on the way is when the land of Israel stops being desolate and starts yielding its agricultural prosperity again. It's an amazing 
Talmudic passage, and one which is very important in the overall scheme of things. Tied to that is something that goes back to the Torah also. I didn't include it in the source sheets because it's just it's a very prevalent theme. The land of Israel depends on rainfall. Okay, so God turns that into a theological piece also. The idea is that since God is in charge of the rain, a good relationship with God will yield good rainfall, and a bad relationship with God will yield drought, which is dreadful if you are a farmer. It's dreadful for everybody, but it's particularly dreadful for the farmers, who it's, for them is literally life and death. So God uses the climate of the land of Israel as a central piece of its significance to the people of Israel. The idea is that they will rely on rainfall, and as a result, they have to, have a, they have to constantly nourish their relationship with God. You know that throughout the Bible, there is a temptation. You know, there's the other side, which is lands that don't rely on rainfall, such as the Garden of Eden, the whole Mesopotamia area, whatever particularly this garden was, Egypt, right, with the Nile River, and the land of Sodom, the city of Sodom, the wicked city of Sodom in the Jordan Valley. Also, its draw to Abraham's nephew Lot was the predictable rising of the Jordan River. So basically, Lot was sick and tired of famines. He didn't like the idea of rainfall dependence. So he said, let's just go to a place where there's a predictable rising river and I'll do better. So the Torah constantly sets that out as the other pole. There are places where, which do not rely on rain. So you have more economic stability. But with that comes a complacency. God doesn't like complacency. God wants the people of Israel to be very attentive to the relationship. Constant reliance on rain requires that. So there's another feature of the land of Israel besides its bounty, and that is simply its dependence on rainfall. Okay, traffic time, we're on the same schedule. Amen to that. Hi, Roy. Uh, Baal as a storm god, as if to replace Hashem. Uh, you're right that Baal was a rival to God, right? Biblically speaking, Baal became, because he's in charge of rain in the Canaanite and Phoenician pantheon, so that's why he was such a serious threat, because the poor Israelite farmers, you know, they should have just served God. They should have done the right thing. But alas, if you're a farmer and it's life and death and you're not as resolute as I just sounded, then you just serve anybody who may give you rain. So the Israelite farmers, particularly in the northern kingdom, had long periods of time where they served both. They served God, but they also served Baal because they figured, look, one of them will give us rain and that's what we want. Little did they realize that if you serve Baal, God gets mad, and then there's a drought. That's what happens in the time of Elijah the prophet. Exactly your point. Okay. Uh, one other thing which is a very interesting concept uh, running through the Bible is the idea that everywhere outside of Israel is considered an impure land. Not exactly clear what that means ritually, but nonetheless, you do have several references to that, including the one I put over here, source number 16. In the book of Amos, I think I may sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. It's very hard to sneeze while you teach. It's, I'm always pleased when that happens. Okay, in the meantime, getting back to business here. But this, I swear, is what the Lord said. Amos is talking to a false, to a, a priest of this illegal shrine. His name is Amatia, and Amos is letting him have it. In the context of the rebuke, he says, but this, I swear, is what the Lord said. Your wife shall play the harlot in the town. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself shall die on unclean soil, for Israel shall be exiled from its soil. So here you have this reference, and there are several others. We're taking for granted that there's some sense of land outside of Israel is somehow defiled. It is not at all clear what that means. But one thing that I will say is that at least following Rambam's opinion, Rambam slash Maimonides, he's very big on this point, and this seems to be fundamentally correct within the Bible itself. Rambam takes what's called, what Professor Menachem Kellner calls a non-essentialist position on holiness. What does that mean? There's nothing metaphysically different about a Jew to a non-Jew. We're all created in God's image. We're all human beings. And there's nothing metaphysically different that separates a Jew and a non-Jew. What separates us is that God gave us the Torah. God created a halachic reality by giving us the Torah. The same is true, he argues, with the Hebrew language. Certain mystical rabbis thought that the Hebrew language has secret properties to, that, to it, which can be considered metaphysically meaningful. Rambam rejected that out of hand. He says the Hebrew language is holy because God gave the Torah in Hebrew. 
The Torah is holy because God gave it, but there's nothing inherently special about Hebrew. If God would have revealed, God, Rambam doesn't say this, but if God would have revealed uh, the Torah to England, it would, have been in the, it would have been in the Queen's English. And then that would be the holy language, nothing because of any uh, inherent value to Queen's English, but just because that would be the recipients of the Torah. So you give them the Torah in a language that they could understand. And the same Maimonides holds is true of the land of Israel. There's no difference metaphysically between the dirt that you find in Israel and the dirt that you find in New Jersey. It's all the same stuff. It's all God's planet, and God made it the way that he did. The land of Israel holds holy status in our tradition because God sanctified it through this covenantal relationship. But there's nothing metaphysically substantive about this holiness. It's simply God's decree. This seems to be fundamentally correct across the boards. Rambam always seems to be correct on all of these issues throughout the entire Bible, despite the fact that certain more mystically inclined rabbis thought that there was something fundamentally different between Jew and non-Jew, or between Israel and outside of Israel, or between Hebrew and any other language, or all of these other things. That would be in a more essentialist position, where you think that there's something essential within you know, certain metaphysical properties within these things. Rambam dismissed that and thought it was incorrect. And Biblically speaking, Rambam is certainly correct. The evidence all matches what he says. And so this idea of it being unclean land doesn't mean that there's anything metaphysically wrong with outside of Israel. The problem is just that it's not the covenantal land between God and Israel. Okay? That seems to be what ha what's happening over here. Very good. The one place, by the way, where where there is such an idea of, of whatever you call it, para sancta, right? This holy dirt. It's a really cool story. You can look it up on your own time. It's in here. I'll use Arabic numeral after my story before I have to listen to that better. In chapter five of Two Kings, there's a story of this pagan general whose name is Naaman. And the prophet in Israel at that time is a man named Elisha, who was the disciple of Elijah the prophet. So Naaman had this horrible skin affliction called sarat, typically mistranslated as leprosy, but it's certainly not leprosy. But in the meantime, I'll call it sarat because we can't really translate it properly. And he got word that he should come to meet Elisha. And Elisha told him how to get cured by go dunking seven times in the Jordan. You could read the whole story there. So he finally does it, dunks seven times, and voila, sarat vanishes. So Naaman essentially becomes a very deeply God-fearing person at that moment. And he very apologetically tells Elisha, look, I really believe in God. However, you know, I'm going back to my, my boss, the king of Aram, who happens to worship idols. So please forgive me if I have to go to ceremonial things for the pagan deities, because what do you want? I live in a pagan world. But then he says something very cute. He says, but I want to take some dirt from Israel, and I'll stand on it when I serve God in Aram. So Elisha says, go ahead, be my guest. You should have realized that there's a real market for this stuff. But in the meantime, he just said, sure, take all the dirt you want. It's fine. To Elisha, there's no value to the dirt itself. What matters is that you're serving God properly. But to Naaman, thinking as a pagan, the dirt itself has some kind of holiness to it, that somehow if you're standing on it in some other country, that still would count as standing in Israel. Whereas we would say, if you're in Israel, you're in Israel. And if you're not in Israel, you're not in Israel. So that's all following Rambam's view. Okay, all very good. So to summarize this piece, uh, the land of milk and honey is a sign of agricultural bounty, which is an essential part of the covenantal dimension of the God-Israel relationship. And the Israel's dependence on rainfall similar, similarly does that. Uh, likewise, the land of Israel is viewed as pure, whereas other lands are considered impure, not in any metaphysical sense, but rather just in the sense of that's not where the people of Israel belong, when they're developing their ideal covenantal relationship with God. So to summarize it with two of the utopian visions of the prophet Isaiah from the 8th century BCE, uh, he ties together all of the different themes that we are doing. And with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up for the day. One is the universal cosmopolitan center that Jerusalem should become the ideal city. And through it, all nations of the world can really come and be influenced because it's such a central location within the world. So that's in source 17 over here, a very celebrated prophecy. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall stand firm above the mountains and tower above the hills, and all the nations shall gaze on it with joy. 
And the many peoples go and say, shall go and say, come, let us go up to the Mount of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall come forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Thus he will judge among the nations and arbitrate for the many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. The idea is that in an ideal world, the people of Israel are faithfully serving God in their temple in Jerusalem. Nations of the world are inspired by this, and they all come flooding from all over the place. And once they adopt the Torah's vision, there certainly will not be any war. The Torah understands very well how to navigate world peace without making anybody share the identical religion. Right? Nobody is expected to become Jewish. Everybody is simply expected to serve God and be moral. That's the basic religion of the Torah. And by doing so, everything would be exactly what King Solomon envisioned at the time of the dedication. And then just to get to the restoration of the Garden of Eden in source number 18, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid, the calf, the beast of prey, and the fatling together with the little boy to herd them. The idea is all of a sudden everybody's an herbivore. Right, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion, like the ox, shall eat straw. A babe shall play over a viper's hole, and an infant pass his hand over an adder's den. In other words, you will have peace, finally, between people and snakes again. After the Garden of Eden created a certain degree of enmity, to put it mildly, between those two species, that will be undone in this messianic era. In all of my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done. For the, land, for the land shall be filled with devotion to the Lord as water covers the sea. It's a beautiful way to bring home all the different pieces that we've been talking about, this universal appeal of the, of the morality of the Torah, the temple serving as that center for religious center of the world, holiness of the land of Israel simply as a means of this is where the God-Israel covenant happens. And so finally having total harmony within humanity and even better, within all of creation, and in essence, restoring the Garden of Eden, which is what the temple and Jerusalem were all supposed to be in the first place. Okay, so hold on one second. Isn't it true that the promises from God indicate that the land of Israel will only be fruitful for Jews, not Gentiles living in the land? Yes, we're going to talk about that next week. It's a, it's a miracle of history, actually, and it's something we'll talk about next week, God willing, when we tie it all together, that these agriculture, the agricul I'm trying to build up you know, the various pieces of the biblical idea of Israel and its significance. And one part is exactly that, that somehow the land of Israel produces only for the people of Israel. So just to jump to one point for, for next week, now, since you're raising this, is that the land of Israel and the people of Israel need each other. And if Israel, if the people are out of the land, the land stops working. Right, so I think your point is extremely well taken. And that is an element of the biblical portrait of what the land of Israel and the people of Israel have to do with one another. Okay, uh, before I sign off and say goodbye and invite you to return next week for our grand finale, I wanna thank the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals for sponsoring this series. I love serving out as a national scholar, as an, an opportunity to really promote a vision. You can check out our website to see the various articles, programs, things that we do. Thank you to all of you who are members and supporters of our institutes that we can carry on. We've been working at it since the year 2007, and it's really been a privilege to be part of that. I want to thank all of you for joining in on these classes, and I look forward to wrapping up the series with you next Thursday at this time. So take care. Have a wonderful week, and of course, please be well. And take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Shabbat shalom. Thank, Thank you, you and Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Yeah. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you.